So I am going to read from Mark chapter 7. The lectionary readings have been going through Mark recently, and um, this was a little while ago, but uh, that doesn't matter. Mark chapter 7, verses 31 to 37. Then Jesus left the vicinity of Tyre and went through Sidon down to the Sea of Galilee and into the region of the Decapolis. There some people brought to him a man who was deaf and could hardly talk, and they begged Jesus to place his hand on him. After he took him aside, away from the crowd, Jesus put his fingers into the man's ears. Then he spit and touched the man's tongue. He looked up to heaven and with a deep sigh said to him, Ephathah, which means be opened. At this the man's ears were opened, his tongue was loosened, and he began to speak plainly. Jesus commanded them not to tell anyone, but the more he did so, the more they kept talking about it. People were overwhelmed with amazement. He's done everything well, they said. He even makes the deaf hear and the mute speak. And that section is headed, Jesus heals a deaf and a mute man. How's your hearing? <laughs> Have you got a voice? <laughs> Jesus is traveling with his disciples and they come into the region of the Decapolis, which um, I had to look up this morning because I couldn't remember where the Decapolis, uh, what the Decapolis was. And um, uh, Mr. Google says that the Decapolis was east and south of Galilee. So that probably would just help you to locate actually where the Decapolis was. And a lot of it was Gentile area. So Jesus and his disciples were traveling among Gentiles. And the people of the area brought to Jesus a man who was deaf and could hardly talk. Just think for a moment, even in these days of modern technology and so much available, how isolating it is to be deaf and to not be able to talk or could, can hardly talk. To not hear anything, to not hear the bird song, to not hear um, warning shouts when somebody says, watch out, to not hear the cars on the road, to um, miss out on family chatter around the table, to be in worship and not hear the song, the music. And even in these days of fantastic hearing aids, and they are fantastic, they can do amazing things these days and other gadgets that help us to make the most of the hearing we have left, there is still an isolating thing about deafness. And then to add to that muteness, the not being able to express yourself in language, how frustrating to not be able to ask for what you want or need, to not be able to express verbally emotion or pain. Yeah, I know, you know, we can show things on our faces and we can do hand things and so on. But um, have you ever been abroad and um, struggled to uh, um, make yourself understood in a restaurant? <laughs> I mean, how frustrating is that? But multiply that in everyday life. And it's not, and, and not be able to engage in the family chatter around the table, at least not very well. And to, um, to have a combination of those things would be so, so difficult and isolating. But it's difficult for the people around that person as well to stop and remember that if more than one person's talking at once, the person who's deaf isn't going to be able to hear the individual voices who miss sentences and questions or only catch certain words and then have to guess what's in the middle and if there is a lot of chatter going on actually it just sounds like a babble 
So it's not just the person who can struggle. It can be everybody around that situation too. And it's interesting, isn't it? This man was brought by other people. Was he brought by family, perhaps, who were all sharing in that struggle? Or was he brought by friends who understood the difficulty he was experiencing? So this man, so many of the people that Jesus healed are unnamed, aren't they? And this is another unnamed man. He was deaf. It says it. He was deaf. And the meaning of the word used for deaf, straightforward. He could not hear. He could not hear. And he could hardly talk. I wondered about this. He could hardly talk because mute usually means can't talk at all, doesn't it? Can't talk at all. So does that mean then that this man can hardly talk at all because he's deaf and he's been deaf since a child and therefore he couldn't hear the language as he grew up and then is, you know, hasn't got words to mimic. Is that why he can hardly talk? So not completely mute, but made mute by his deafness, perhaps. Or perhaps something so distressing has happened to him that actually he is unwilling to talk, just unable, unwilling to express anything in words. So you won't be surprised, I looked up what the underlying word was for hardly talk. And to my surprise, it means stammer. He stammered. Stammering, of course, is a speech disorder. I can't believe that nobody here has heard somebody struggling with a stammer which disrupts the flow of speech, either by long pauses or repetitive sounds. Um, Words get stuck. Have you all seen the King's Speech? Most of you have seen the King's Speech. So, I don't know how Colin Firth did it. I, I do not know how... He must have spent hours practicing how to replicate the glottal sounds and the the struggle to to express in words what he wanted to say. And of course, in his role and position, had to speak publicly. It must be then your worst nightmare. So having a stammer has an external component so that the people who are listening um, are aware, but there's also an inner component that is probably much less visible. But for somebody who stammers, um, maybe a shame that goes with it, maybe a frustration because they they know the trigger of the stammer, so they have to avoid words that start with a certain letter or start with a certain syllable, and therefore they're always having to think of a different word to put in its place so that they don't get caught out or tripped up. And that then means that the language that you express isn't precisely as you might have wanted to have said it. It has to be altered in some way. Or maybe the person who stammers chooses to avoid the problem by saying nothing at all, because then you don't get caught out. And then you're left out. Maybe the sense that you were bullied at school because of it. And so then you just didn't talk at all. The possibility of being made to feel foolish. So if our man is deaf and has a stammer, then life would be difficult for him, wouldn't it? Very, very difficult. Isolating, lonely, um, left out of so much. And his family and friends bring him to the Lord. And you know, I love the way that the Lord never repeats anything the same way. He's he's dealt with deaf men before and he will do again, but he doesn't do what he's done before with this man and he doesn't do with others what he does with this man. He treats us individually, doesn't he? 
and so for us. We might all have a common ailment, but he would treat us all separately, individually, in just exactly the way that we need. There's no kind of, oh, you're deaf, right, so what we do is none of that. Completely individual, tailored plan just for us. And Jesus took him aside from the crowd. Isn't that a lovely thing to do? Maintained his dignity. It's not clear if family and friends came too, but he certainly took him aside. And Jesus put his fingers in the man's ears. I think we could probably cope with that thought, couldn't we? That Jesus put his fingers just in the man's ears. No different to Jesus touching eyes and um, arms and things that he's done to bring healing. And then he spits on his finger and touches the man's tongue. <laughs> That's a bit different, isn't it? He spits on his fingers and touches the man's tongue. In another situation, Jesus spat in the dust and put the mud on somebody's eye. This is not that at all. That caused outrage when he did that. And it wasn't the spitting that caused outrage. It was the fact that he spat in the dust and made mud, and it was the Sabbath, and it was work. That's why it caused outrage. This is very different. He spits on his finger and touches the man's tongue. What might that be about, then? Well, I had a look at um, what the Jewish perspective was on spitting and saliva in general, just to see what they said. And in, in New Testament times, and of course, you won't be surprised, you know, to spit in someone's face was a gesture of disrespect and contempt. But that's not what Jesus did, is it? He wasn't showing any disrespect or anything. Saliva, different matter. The Jewish perspective on saliva was that it had healing properties. No wonder then that Jesus has used saliva in other ways. I bet your mum used saliva on you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. She might not have quite licked your wounds, but she might have dabbed her tongue and rubbed something when you fell over and grazed your knee if you were out walking and there was nothing else. Dogs lick their wounds, don't they? and it's considered to be healing. And even today, it is recognised that saliva is an antiseptic. It has antiseptic properties in it. If it didn't, our mouths, which are quite dirty places, um, because of the food we eat and the bacteria that works on it and so on, if we didn't have saliva with antiseptic properties, our mouths would be a mass of... Um, Yuckiness, let's just leave it there. But um, the growth of bacteria in our mouths would get out of control. The antiseptic in our saliva keeps it under control. How much saliva do we make a day? Any idea? Gallons, says Veronica, gallons. That's a tad over the top. <laughs> tad over the top. About a pint? About a pint? Yeah, half a litre. It's quite a lot though, isn't it? And it moistens and lubricates and so on. Yucky as it sounds, the Jews would have understood that actually saliva has antiseptic properties. Is that what caused this man's healing to happen? No, of course not. But there is, it's, it's interesting that Jesus gave something of himself, isn't it, to this man. He touched his tongue with some of his saliva. So he put his fingers in his ears, in the deaf ears, and he touched the man's tongue with some saliva. And then Jesus sighed. He sighed. And I wonder if that was his prayer. Because the sighing was akin to those verses in Romans that talk about the groaning in the spirit when there are things that we can't express. And it's that same kind of concept. And 
there is something about this, um, this sigh that has deep, unexpressed emotion, deep feeling that can't be put into words easily. And I wonder if, um, if that groan of Jesus was something of his, his emotional pain, his frustration at the situation of this man. And it was his heart cry to the Lord to bring some release and to bring some healing. Maybe even some anger, righteous anger, at this man's life and the difficulties he was experiencing. It's one of the few glimpses we have into the emotional life of Jesus. This groan, this sigh that expressed so much to heaven that actually we don't, we don't get the words of it, we only get the, the concept of it. Something about this man's situation touched him deeply and he acted out of compassion. Mark doesn't pinpoint why, he just says that's how it was. And then Jesus says, Ephathah, Ephathah. That's not a Greek word that um, the New, most of the New Testament is written in. That's an Aramaic word, Jesus' own language. So we get Jesus' expression in his own language in this moment. And when that happens in the Gospels, it's usually done to underline the intimacy of that moment. Isn't that lovely? This was an intimate moment between Jesus, his father in heaven, and this man in front of him. Something of the personal relationship that Jesus is engaging in as he prays for this man. We haven't got the words of the prayer. All we've got is the fact that he groaned to the father in his spirit, Ephatha, which literally means be open, be opened all the way, be opened completely. And when he said that, the verses tell us that the man's ears were opened and his tongue was loosened. The command of Jesus be opened had been fulfilled. Literally, the impediment was released. I like that. The impediment was released. He was set free. What was holding him back set him free. And the result was, what does it say? He began to speak plainly. In fact, Literally, he chattered. <laughs> he chattered. This man who could hardly talk obviously had so much to say that he chattered. He chattered. This healing of Jesus for this man out of his compassion literally tore the walls down of what was holding this man captive. Tore the walls down. And the way to life was opened by God. It's a miracle of healing. It's also a parable because as Jesus was doing things around the area to, um, and talking to Jews and to Gentiles, the, the parable was that um, this was going to be happening in people's lives. People's lives were going to be opened up. There was going to be spiritual hearing that was going to come in an increased way. And we are the blessed recipients of that, aren't we? So what about for us today? Are there areas of life where we are deaf? Maybe there are areas where, in a sense, we have a stammer or a speech impediment or the inability to express in words how we are feeling. Is there an area where we need the Lord to say to us, be opened? Let your ears be open to hear me. Let your mouths be open so that you can express exactly how you feel to me. Be released from what keeps you deaf. Be released from what keeps you expressing your heart. It's 
So this morning, hear and know Christ whispering into your very heart and spirit, Ephatha, be opened, be set free, be released. Let those walls come down. Amen.